Lady Malos, good morning. I'd like, if I can, to spend just a few minutes this morning um, drawing the threads together on the submissions I made yesterday in relation to buildings. In my submission, there are four questions that are relevant to that debate in this court. First question, does the fact that Parliament has used an ordinary word, a building, mean that one simply applies a dictionary definition? We say no. Because building is a flexible term used differently in different statutory contexts. Uh, submission accepted rightly by the upper tribunal of paragraphs 123 to 124, and that does reflect the authorities, in particular, the approach of this court in Guy, of paragraphs 22, 23, 26, and then the application of that approach at 34. It also reflects uh, the judgment of Lady Justice Rose in the SSE case at 39. Chameleon words are not a binary choice between the widest possible dictionary meaning and a narrow one, and a term in a particular statute does not necessarily have its widest possible meaning. Now, in none of those cases, including the Morrison, the old Morrison case about walls, in none of those cases was the relevant word defined. But in all of those cases, the meaning of a combination of the ordinary meaning informed by context. Now, that does not mean, assuming here that Parliament intended some unnatural meaning, merely that Parliament intended building to be understood in the context of the Capital Allowances Code, where the function of the trade, the function of the asset in the trade is central, and Parliament has specifically differentiated between structures. Question two, did the first tier apply the correct statutory meaning? We say no, because the FTT failed to identify that building can, and has been held to have, different meanings in different contexts. Indeed, the FTT included no discussion of the approach to be taken as to context here, and that is the upper tribunal's first criticism at their paragraph one. Significantly, the FTT expressly addressed the question on the basis of whether the assets are naturally described as a building, and that is reflected in the Upper Tribunal's <coughs> second criticism, also at paragraph 131. But that's wrong, we say, because anything which falls into any of the possible definitions of a building might naturally be described as a building, but that's just not the relevant question. The relevant question here is whether it falls within the meaning of the term in this particular statutory context. Now, it's important here to note that the FTT did not say that whether something is naturally described as a building was a factor to be weighed in the balance. Properly read, the FTT's decision was because these assets were naturally described as buildings, or could naturally be described as buildings, they were therefore buildings for the purposes of this statute. And in doing so, we say the first tier effectively applied the widest possible meaning of the term, devoid of context here, where the statute requires room to be made for structures. In that regard, it is relevant in our submission to bear in mind what it was that the first tier found as to the form and function of the various assets. And it is instructive to look again at the block diagrams that were annexed to both of the decisions below, starting with the storage rafts, because those storage rafts were not challenged by the Commission. The outside storage rafts on which the cylinders holding uranium sit constitute a slab and radiation shielding walls, but because they're in the open air, there's no roof slab, no ceiling slab. And that outside storage raft was not challenged by the commissioners. So when one approaches the later block diagrams, one of the differences, in the eyes of the commissioners at least, we say wrongly ultimately in the eyes of the first year, <coughs> 
was that you had flab radiation shielding and attenuation walls and a roof slab so as to constitute a concrete wall. So let me be clear. Is, do I understand you to be submitting that it is an error of principle not to differentiate between a structure that has a roof and a structure that does not have a roof? My submission, my lord, is that one has to have regard when looking at the assets that are in dispute to both their form and their function and bear in mind that what is said here to be a building is the same as one of the assets that wasn't challenged where the difference being that there is no roof. Right, so you, given you've not answered my question, let me turn it around and ask it differently. Do you accept that in considering whether an asset is a building, it is relevant to take into account whether or not it has a roof? Yes. And do you also accept that one can rationally distinguish between assets that have roofs on the one hand and assets that do not have roofs on the other hand? One can rationally distinguish that the existence or otherwise of the roof cannot itself be the determining factor. Are you suggesting that the FTT treated the presence or absence of a roof as determinative, and if so, which paragraph of the decision do you rely upon? Well, I was about to just remind you, I don't want to take up the court's time by reading chunks of the first tier, but can I give you the paragraph reference? So what the first tier did in relation to each of the facilities... Just give me the best. Give me the one best paragraph that you say shows that the FTT erred in principle by treating the presence or absence of a roof as determinative. If you can turn up the first tier decision, my lord, and behind tab 17 in the core binding, and if one keeps a finger in the block diagrams at the back of the judgment, which is at 252 and onwards, and then look to see what the first tier has to say about the facilities, each of them. I'm just asking for your best paragraph. Well, they are all best paragraphs, though I recognise there's a difference when you get to the uranium oxide score. But if we take, for example, the kiln facility, paragraph 48, and so you have that in mind, the block diagram is at page 254 of the bundle. Paragraph 48 gives the area separated from the vaporisation facility by a handling hall, which is not in dispute. It is a multi-storey structure designed around the items of equipment which it supports. It is seismically qualified and provides containment. Occupancy is restricted to necessary inspection and maintenance. No radiation shielding is required to protect the environment or operators, save in relation to the oxide packing. And then he goes on to deal with the existence of the hopper. And then in paragraph 50, he identifies the different elements that go to make up that structure. So brass slab, basement, external reinforced concrete walls. And yes, he does mention a roof. Then at 51, no radiation shielding is required, save for the block work wall. And then 52, the structure, as a matter of fact, provides shelter to the equipment because of the roof and operators in the facility. However, this is incidental to its intended function of containment. Now, what he goes on to say, and this is a separate criticism, is because he ascribes a categorization to certain of those functions, he comes to the conclusion that that is to be seen necessarily as a building. And one can make equivalent points. I'll just give you the reference. I'm sorry, Mr. Peacock, I'm lost. What started this discussion was your submission 
that one could test the FTT's reasoning by reference to the fact that there was an asset which had been accepted by the revenue as being one for which allowances could be claimed. And the asset in question, you pointed out, was an asset which did not have a roof. You also pointed out that the assets in dispute do have roofs. And you appeared to be suggesting that that meant that there was some flaw in the FTT's reasoning. You have accepted, in answer to my questions, that in fact it is relevant and material to take into account whether the asset has a roof or not, but still you seem to be submitting that there's some error in the FTT's reasoning whereby they have treated the presence or absence of a roof as determinative. I asked you to identify the single best paragraph to support your submission, and I'm still waiting. That was not my submission. My submission was not that roof, no roof, is determinative. No, that's not your submission. Your submission was that the FTT had treated it as determinative. Well, that was also not my submission. So we arrive at this position. You accept the presence or absence of a roof is relevant, and you accept that the FTT did not treat the presence or absence of a roof as determinative. So where, therefore, does the FTT err in law? The point I was making, my lord, was this, that our criticism of the FTT, in agreement with the upper tribunal, is that insofar as the FTT looked beyond the form at function, its approach to function was erroneous because it has miscategorized the functions of the assets that it finds in each of the paragraphs where it deals with. Right. So in other words, the presence or absence of a roof is a complete red herring. It's all about function. No, my lord. My submission and the approach of the upper tribunal below, and I think now the approach of my learned friend, is that both form and function are relevant. So I'm mystified, Mr. Peacock. What is your submission as to the significance of what was said in the FTT's decision as to the fact that the structures in question had roofs? I'm absolutely lost as to what your submission is now. My lord, if I go back just perhaps a few minutes, my submission is that the first year's approach in addressing what might naturally be described as buildings was an error. It was a statutory construction approach that was in error. Allied to that, we have a criticism, which is also the upper tribunal's third criticism, and it's paragraph 131, that where the first year did take account of function, its approach was erroneous because it is miscategorizing the functions that it identified as being premises functions, because they're functions typically found at buildings, without reflecting on the proper functions played by those assets in this trade. Now, to give your lordship an example of that, it is not sufficient to say, as the first year did, that a building typically provides shelter, therefore anything that provides shelter is a building. Nor is it right to say, as the first year did, a building typically contains, therefore anything that provides containment is a building. I'm sorry, where did the FTT say that anything that provides shelter is a building? Where did they say that? Can we turn up, if your lordship has, the first year's decision, beginning at paragraph 111. Paragraph 112 
We accept it's my submission that the predominant purpose of the CHF and the OS is to protect the public off-site and employees on-site, that's why the radiation shielding, etc. Um, and he says, however, I consider that radiation shielding and containment can also be a function of a building. And 130, he records my submission about the predominant function of the vaporization facility to kill debris and dispense it to the, to the heating to support machinery and equipment or to provide radiation and pulse containment. He says, I accept that that's their predominant function. That does not mean that they are not buildings. Um, he then refers to the, the external cladding, which he disregards in effect as a, as a factor. 115, he then turns to deal with each of them in turn, beginning with the CHF, four walls and a roof, encloses volume of space. Um, the roof can protect <coughs> the shield roof from the elements, otherwise the roof and walls are not intended to provide shelter to material equipment machinery operators, but do contain radiation. Uh, and then he says at the foot of that page, so then 115, it also functions as a building in containing. So, so far you've looked at four paragraphs and you have not identified a single sentence in which he says that anything that provides shelter is a building. But the effect of what he does as regards each of them, reading the judgment as a whole, and fairly as we must do, his conclusion is, because it has those functions, and in the case of the CHF, because it looks like a building, he considers that in everyday terminology it is naturally described as a building. One can see it again at the end of 117, dealing with the vaporization facility. The principal function of the ground floor, con con ground floor concrete box is containment, which is a typical function of a building. I consider that the vaporization facility as a whole is naturally described as a building. So, read fairly, what he is saying there is because these assets um, provide containment or in some cases, a measure of shelter. Because containment and shelter are typical functions of a building, they then may, for this statutory purpose, be naturally described as a building. We say, and the upper tribunal below said, that that was an error. And one can see it at its starkest in 122, dealing with a condenser facility, Yes, in my view, this structure is very much at the margin as to whether it would naturally be described as a building. He concludes that uh, it should be uh, properly described as a building. And he arrives at that conclusion in the second sentence, third sentence, however, one of the functions of this structure is to contain hazardous fumes. As such, so containment, it does fulfill one of the functions of a building, and with four walls, a roof, and internal floors, it gives the appearance of the building. On balance, I am satisfied that it is properly described as a building. And we say, with respect to the first year, in agreement with the other part, that that line of reasoning is an error. So we do um, seek to uphold each of the criticisms upper tribunal made as regards the first tier, that would then take me to my third question, did the upper tribunal overstep its role? We say no, because looking at the uh, difficulties that the upper tribunal identified with the first tier's decision, on any view, the first tier's conclusion about building is not Perhaps understandably, the upper tribunal didn't feel able to say that these items were not buildings, but it wasn't satisfied that the FTG's conclusions that they were buildings were safe. Hence the remit. And by way of guidance on the remitter, the upper tribunal does emphasize the importance of function in the context of this statutory code. <coughs> and that with respect to the upper tribunal is indeed helpful judicial guidance on the meaning of the term in this context and is no different from what this court did in Guy as regards the crematoria.
Question four, how might consideration of this issue in the first tier, second time around, produce a different result? Well, it's a different analysis grounded in the statutory context of building in section 21. It would involve a different approach to the function of each of these assets, and it would not suffer from what we say is the categorization error as to function. And once one adopts that corrected approach in the first tier, it is possible, at least in our submission, that the result would be different. Now, of course, I have to accept that the result might be the same. But the upper tribunal could not say, in respect this court should not say, that the result would be the same. And that's why it was appropriate for this to be remitted for the first tier to be considered again. Now, one of the difficulties of tackling section 21 first, the point I touched on yesterday, we started in the wrong place. It only makes sense when tackling these questions to start with the common law so that you can get straight what the assets are, what functions they perform, and whether ultimately they constitute apparatus with which the business is carried on or premises in which the business is carried on. Once one can see that and assess here the errors that the upper tribunal said that the first tier made on that common law question, then it's much easier to approach the statutory question of whether this asset is a building. And I make no real complaint about Mullen and Friend's course, but it does have this defect that you're asked to address the statutory question without having gone through the necessary exercise of addressing the nature and form and function of these assets from a common law point of view. And there is a grave danger that you're asked to answer the building question in the abstract without having gone through that very helpful exercise of looking at whether the first tier was right or wrong about the common law. I know it's helpful to use common law as a kind of shorthand in this context, because it is still a question of statutory interpretation. It's really a matter of judge-made law. Is that a slightly more accurate way of looking at it? I was going to turn any second to that question, ground two, and just remind your lordship, I think you're well aware, that it's been described as a judge-made rule or a judge-made interpretation of the meaning of plant and section. But I'm puzzled by that, because why is it any different to any other issue of statutory construction? I mean, that is the function of the courts, is to interpret and apply the wording adopted by Parliament, and that's true regardless of the context. Why is it any different here? I think the difference, my lord, if you look back at the sweep of the cases now over 100 years, is that Parliament used the statutory term in the tax context of plant, which had been used in Yarmouth and France in an employer's liability context. The term has never been defined in the tax context. But this is always true when you have a statutory word which is not defined. So that always poses a question for the court. How do you interpret this word, which Parliament has chosen to use but not to define? That is true, my lord, yes, I accept that. But what has built up over time, beginning with the horse in Yarmouth and France, is this understanding derived from what the courts have had to say about the meaning. To be sure, but why is that any different from millions of other statutory contexts where you have plenty of case law interpreting a word that Parliament has used but not defined? Well, my lord, it may well not be. But I am here merely repeating to your lordships and my lady what's said in this court and elsewhere about the nature of the meaning of plant in what's now Section 11. A sort of similar issue is the meaning of trade, I suppose, which again, of course, is there in the statutes. 
its meaning in many cases to this day, and it's really as a result of a clear judge-made construct. Yeah. But in the context of interpreting that word in in, in its statutory context. Yeah, in the Income and Corporation Tax Act, as, as was or now the Income Tax yeah. and Corporation Tax Act. But I'm not sure this is, well, it shouldn't be controversial, but if you need the references, the nature of this being a judge-made or judge-identified concept or rule, it's addressed in, in ANDAR, which is Volume 2, Tab 25. It's Lord Justice Peter Gibson, page, uh, page 1172. But it's also in Scottish and Newcastle, which is Volume 1, Tab 19, at page 233. So unless I can help you further on building, I would then turn to ground two. We identified what we believe to be the relevant principles in our skeleton argument uh, on the appeal uh, of paragraphs 41 to 43. Uh, <coughs> to avoid me having to take you to I just invite you to turn that up. It's the four volume tab three. <coughs> Paragraph 41, um, the references I've, I've just given you, tend to be a, a developing a, an artificial way and have a largely judge made meaning. Um, and then in 42, uh, we've sought to identify the relevant principles starting with the Arms of France. Uh, and then 43, uh, we've mentioned the recent of this court in Cheshire. Two things just to add to that um, identification of relevant principles. My Lord Lord Justice Henderson yesterday um, identified uh, that uh, he saw Wimpy and the judgment of Mr. Hoffman as being um, particularly helpful. And we certainly wouldn't dissent from that. Um, if you have the first volume of authorities to hand, I just want to identify the, the relevant passages that, that we ought to be looking at. Behind tab 21, volume 1. <coughs> and I think there you have a tax case report. Um, so you get the decision of the commissioners and then the High Court and then this court. But his Lordship's judgment in the High Court begins at bundle page 281. It's unfortunate this being an electronic problem than a photographic introduction. This is an error. No line is missed out. Also sort of the page. Uh, um, it's a paragraph of the first beginning before getting any further, I must say something about the third distinction in the way in which the courts and subject matrix have refined to be. And then the words missing are boundary between plant and premises. The words quotes apparatus, dot dot dot, goods and, and then it carries on. Chapels, fixed or movable. Well, wait, I hadn't noticed that. Um, if need be, we can, we can provide a, a better copy, or we can look it up in a different version. But it's one of the problems of that with the use of electronic versions, is they do often just contain obvious, <coughs> obvious errors. And well, th that, your logic has that passage in mind. Um, he, his logic there very carefully. Carves out non business assets, yes. then carves out stock and trade, which is a business asset but not the right sort of asset, and then he identifies the distinction between um, an asset you use in your business, the apparatus, um, and the asset that is merely the place or the setting or the premises um, in which. The other passage I was just going to draw your attention to um, is on page 282. Uh, in the middle of that page, there's a paragraph, it will be seen, therefore. And it's that paragraph that is then later picked up in some of the later authorities uh, as references to business use and premises. If one wants to know where they came from, it's that that next paragraph. So we, we 
entirely agree with that. We don't dissent from that in, in any way. Um, the other point, just to make in terms of principle, is um, the decision of this court in Cheshire Cavities. Now, there had been um, a belief, I think it was the orthodoxy, that where you had an asset that had a plant-like function, apparatus, and a premises-like function, the authorities, at least to my eye, appeared to say that as long as you had at least a plant-like function, then it, the asset would be treated as plant. And there were references in the authority to an asset merely being a betting as the rule that excluded you from a business. <coughs> and that was the basis of, upon which the first here in this case addressed the, the common law or judge-made question. Now, in Cheshire Cavities, it was said um, that that's not the right divide, and where you have an asset that has both an apparatus function and a premises function, the relevant test is asked to ask whether it's more appropriate to regard the asset as premises or as plant. Is there an application or permission to appeal to the Supreme Court, Ted? No. no. Thank you. Um, but I do formally reserve in this case, should this case go on, the right to say in the Supreme Court that the decision of this court is wrong, and that one ought to revert back to what I think of as the orthodoxy. Now, for present purposes, in a sense, so what? Um, I have to accept that the decision of this court in Cheshire Cavities is fine. But that has no other material um, relevance here, because we're not concerned with assets that were said to have both functions by the first tier. Um, in the sense that the first tier didn't apply what is now said to be the test by this court. <coughs> and just for your note, you can see how the first tier approached this at the, the first tier paragraphs 74, 89, and 90. We've put Cheshire Cavity aside for now. The question uh, as to the meaning of plant, is that itself a question of fact or law? And the answer is it's a question of law. The meaning of the statutory term is a question of law. The Lord Justice Nugee in the Devon Waste case that we saw briefly mentioned yesterday. The application of that term properly understood is a question of fact. And that's recorded in our paragraphs 44 and 45 in our, in our skeleton. But once the fact-finding tribunal has identified the function of an asset, so what action does it do? The categorization of that function involves the application of the legal principle such that if the fact-finding tribunal miscategorizes the function as being plant when it should be premises or vice versa, then appeal courts can intervene. And that's what happened indirectly in Barclay Curl when the majority overruled Margaret. But it's undoubtedly what happened in the car wash case of Andar. Because in that case, the fact finding commissioners had determined that a car wash hall worked like a machine processing cars to be washed, and then in effect fitting them out at the other end of the clean cars. And this court said, no, that's wrong wrong as a matter of law, this court overturned that decision on the basis that the fact-finding commissioners had mischaracterized or miscategorized the functions of the asset. And Andoff is in volume two, 
do have 25, and you can see the effect of what Lord Justice Peter Gibson does at pages 1177C through to 1178C. Now, in case it's relevant, there's also a footnote point to Andorff. The taxpayer in Andorff ran a series of arguments. There was one argument that the whole wash hall was plant. There was a second argument that some part of the wash hall was plant. And there was a third argument that you then looked at each of the individual items of equipment. And in this court in Andorff, the first argument was rejected. By this court overruling the fact finding commissioners. But in Andorff, the case was remitted to the commissioners for them to consider the second and third arguments. So Andorff's an example of a case where the court um, thought that the fact finding body had miscategorized the function. That was an error of law. It did not um, justify the conclusion the fact finding body had arrived at, but the case was remitted. Here, our complaint about the first year was that it erred in law in treating certain functions that it had found uh, that the facilities uh, played as necessarily being premises or setting functions when they were plant our core headline complaint on ground two was that it was an error of categorization like Andoff or Margaret. And in particular, we objected to the first year's um, conclusion that a containment function was necessarily a premises function. When we know from the water tower that contains the water in Margaret grain silo that contained the grain in Schofield, or indeed a gas tank that contains gas. The fact that your item has a containment function doesn't necessarily mean it's not a plant. Equally, the fact that an item may shelter that which is inside does not necessarily lead to the conclusion that it is premises. The conclusion that the first year arrived at is in effect in its paragraph 95. Four bundles It rightly identifies the trade carried on by Urenco at the TMF, that the deconversion of tails so as to produce and store uranium oxide and to produce hexafluoric acid for sale as an industrial material. All the processes carried out at TMF are directed towards those ends. We agree with that. I consider that the safety functions of shielding, containment, and seismic qualification are properly viewed as part of the setting in which that trade is carried out. And he goes on to deal with Wangaratta, which I'll come to in a moment. And he says towards the foot of that paragraph that safety is significant structures provide a safe setting for processes to be carried out. Without the structures, the actual processes could still be carried on efficiently, though I accept that it is entirely theoretical that the regulatory environment is not permitted. The regulatory environment is not, in my view, relevant to whether an asset performs a function in the trade. I'm saying not at all relevant. It cannot be said that in providing shielding and or containment, the structures have any function but in the actual processing of tail. What the upper tribunal said of that paragraph in accepting submissions that we had made was that the relevant test is not actual processing. One can't determine and categorize function in the abstract. You have to do that exercise in the real world, looking at the trade that can be carried on and actually is carried. So to say that theoretically you could do this um, absent the regulatory regime is, is not a good point at all. And 
it's not a good point. Actually, it's not just the regulatory regime that stops you. Um, if you didn't have these assets and you tried to run this process, you would kill your operatives. You just can't carry on this trade without these assets. It's true the regulator wouldn't allow you, but you couldn't physically do it because of the, the risk. Now that's an error. Um, but the other error that's baked into paragraph 95 is the assumption that containment and shelter can only be premises functions or attributes. So we made those submissions to the upper tribunal. Uh, we pointed out as regards actual processing that it may be that the tribunal below had confused the distinction found not to be a good one in law between an active function and a passive function. The upper tribunal recognizes that that's a possible reading of what the first year did. But in any event, the relevant test is not a function in the actual process. And the best example we can think of that reveals that is think of an office desk and a chair in a widget manufacturing business. Now, it may well be said that the office desk and chair play no role in the actual manufacturing of widgets but they are nonetheless capable of being, at least are, plant. So that reference, which is repeated throughout the uh, first year's decision to actual processing, is an error of law. The first year's approach um, to containment and shelter, assuming that they can only be premises functions is an error of law. And uh, first here's approach to testing the function of an asset by reference to a trade you could only carry on theoretically, but not in the real world, is an error of law. <coughs> and those errors that we identified were accepted and we say with respect to rightly so. Now, I'll come to the upper tribunal decision in just a moment, but I need to say something about Wangaratta. Because it was said by the first year um, not to help my case, indeed to be inconsistent with my case. Um, we looked at it briefly with my learned friend yesterday, but Wangaratta is behind tab 11 in volume 1. <coughs> so, the decision of the High Court of Australia, my Lord, Lord Justice Henderson's point, it's not clear to me whether there was some kind of quasi judicial role of the Commissioner of Taxes in Australia against which you had a right of appeal, or whether it's simply the making of an assessment where slightly oddly, you had a right to appeal to the High Court. Um, and I can't answer that, my Lord, but, but my friend is right to say it was a, a, a decision of the High Court of Australia sitting the first time. So what Mr Justice um, Tierney had to address was the particular asset. Now, it does bear careful reading to understand what the, the asset is. Um, and I'm not going to invite you to read it now. Um, but there is a suitable description of it over, admittedly, quite a few pages, um, beginning um, uh, page 89 of the bundle, just below halfway down, on the application of the taxpayer. And that refers to a site visit, and then the evidence discloses the following facts. So the next two and a half, maybe three and a half pages, um, identify uh, the, the, the assets concerned. Now, just turning on to his judgment, page 9 of the report, page 95 of the bundle, it's important to note just below halfway down, the second poll part, there's a reference to a case called Broken Hill Proprietors. And what Mr. Justice Tito had said about the word plant. Uh, and again, I, I invite you to to read that uh, in due course because it um, is cited with approval by Lord Lowry in the Schofield. So, broken.
Broken Hill is important here. And then what the judge goes on to say, next page, page 96 of the Rumble, he cites uh, the decision of the House of Lords in Barclay Curl, just as, uh, as your note. This was heard um, in um, March of 1969. <coughs> and that was just after. Same year, but but one shortly after the other. Um, and then I think you were shown this, but below the reference to Barclay Curl was a paragraph in which I am of the opinion that. And what the judge there identifies is that the, the inner structure, i.e., inside the external padding, um, is more than a convenient setting for the appellant's operation. This is an essential part in the efficient and economic operation of the appellant's business. A complex ventilation system, including the cavity wall, does more than merely clear the atmosphere. The structure is an active tool in preventing spoiling of material and in enabling the operatives to carry out their tasks. And he goes on to deal with the, the extraction of gases and the, the drains of, of uh, liquid. So one needs to, to read all of that paragraph from I am of the opinion that um, down to at the end of the first paragraph on the next page. Um, but it's also instructive in, in our submission to look on to page 99 of the bundle, page 13 of the report, to identify what view the judge took of the demountable walls. And that's six lines down on that page 13. The next item is the demountable wall. Identified that they're movable panels. Um, he describes them um, designed to deal with, um, with vapors, and then six lines further down, seven lines further down, I have no doubt that these wall panels are manufacturing plant, movable, etc. Uh, and he goes on to say at the foot of that paragraph, these panels are much more obviously plant than the panels in Gerald and John Good, because they actually act as shields between different operations rather than being passive dividers. So our asset is different. I, of course, I accept that. But there is a clear parallel there between the assets in Wangaratta that had a shielding function held by the High Court of Australia to be plant and some of the assets that we are here concerned with, which have a radiation shielding and then attenuation so in the first tier, we said, properly understood, Wangaratta supports our case. A, a submission I repeated in the upper tribunal and repeat again uh, today. And it is a decision that is inconsistent with the first tier's approach in its paragraphs 77 and 95. There is, in effect, no difference between removing toxic hazards and shielding operations or operatives in Wangaratta and containing and or attenuating hazards uh, in the present case where you are also in part providing shielding to operations or operatives. And my learned friend suggested yesterday that, well, this is a rather old case uh, and it's before Wimpy. We said either it's contained, confined to its own facts or it's wrongly Decided, uh, and with respect, we say no. It's quite clear that Wangaratta was um, derived from Barclay Curl, which itself was derived from Yarmouth in France. It's expressed uh, as a decision of the High Court of Australia uh, by reference to the right principles, the relevant principles. Uh, it purports to apply English common law principles. And it is cited and approved in this court in Schofield, Lord Lowry, and in Anduff by Lord Justice Peter Gibson. I look back also at Carr and Sayer, and my Lord appears to have cited it in Carr and Sayer. So it's mentioned in the judgment of the Vice Chancellor, and my Lord may recall he appeared for the revenue and nobody. I can't remember the details of the hearing. Well, that's 
that's recorded in the report. I mean, <laughs> um, I, I, I put it no higher than you appear to have cited it. One well, I probably did, particularly if there was nobody there but the bank there. <laughs> um, uh, and his lordship in that case mentions the, the decision. Um, he doesn't particularly offer an editorial comment. Yes. Um, but it is clearly approved by Lord Lowry in Schofield, who also approves what Mr. Justice Kitto had to say in Broken Hill The fact that it was before Wimpy is true, but we say of no consequence because his lordship, Mr. Justice Hoffman in Wimpy, was purporting to elucidate what had been said by <laughs> Lindsay in Yarmouth and France. So the fact that Wangaratta predates Wimpy is true, but, but, but don't you know that? So we do say it is a relevant and important decision. Approved, uh, cited and approved in this court, um, and should be a relevant part of this debate here, and not a case that's confined to its facts or to treaties wrongly decided. Now, what then did the upper tribunal say? Um, one needs to take the upper tribunal decision up at uh, beginning of paragraph 76. identifies um, that a critical issue is determining function. Um, towards the, the end of 76, um, it records that an item or structure which fulfills both functions will nevertheless be plant, but it's not merely the second. Now, that's is that correct in the light of Cheshire cavity? Um, no. Um, and that's in effect the point they're making in 77. As we've noted, the parties agreed as do we that these are accurate descriptions of the applicable principles, subject possibly to the issues discussed earlier arising from Cheshire Cavity. So when um, this tribunal, this upper tribunal was considering, there had been the upper tribunal's decision in Cheshire Cavity, but not this court. So the error is an error in favour of your clients, not in favour of the rebels. That is to be determined, my lord, because the first tier didn't apply the more appropriate to regard test where it considered that an asset had both functions, not the test that was applied here. Now, it would have to be applied on a remitter unless the decision of this court in Cheshire Cavities is overturned. And then the upper tribunal correctly records that if there's a misapplication or misunderstanding of the principles, then that is an error of law. Lord Lowry and Scotch in Newcastle, so that's right. Um, and then they recall Mr. Bremner saying you've got to read the decision as a whole. That's fine, there's no difficulty with that. Uh, and then it's paragraph 80 onwards where the upper tribunal identifies <coughs> criticisms that it makes and the errors of law that it finds the first tier made, and they are in effect the submissions I've made to you this morning rather briefly, but we do say that the upper tribunal's analysis from paragraph 80 um, down to 87 is right in law. The upper tribunal were right to identify those errors that indeed had been made. It's not sufficient, as my own friend faintly did yesterday in his oral submissions, but more clearly does in his skeleton arguments, to say that this is somehow all a matter of fact. It's not. One has to apply, has to identify and then apply correctly the relevant legal principles. This court has the benefit of
stand by what we say there and invite you in due course to, to, to refresh your, your, your memories of, of what we say about that. Now, there's one further point on ground two, which is the scope of the remitter that the upper tribunal directs. What the upper tribunal say, uh, in paraphrase, is they were satisfied that the first tier had erred as regards building and had erred as regards the, the judge made or common law rule. The upper tribunal was not satisfied that it itself could answer those questions and the case was sent back. But it was sent back to address the assets uh, in relation to which the errors had been identified in effect, the assets where we'd lost. What my friend now says is that that remitter, if that's the line we go down, should also reconsider or re-examine the assets where we won. That would extend to parts of the kiln facility and the vaporisation facility where the first tier did agree that they were plumb. Now, there's no basis for that submission in this court. Um, the assets we won on were appealed by my learned friends to the upper tribunal, and that appeal was rejected in the upper tribunal at paragraph 176. But that part of the upper tribunal's decision was not subject of an appeal to this court was not said by way of a separate round of appeal that if there is to be a remitter, the remitter ought to be broader. The consequence of that is that if there is to be a remitter, it should extend to the assets on which we lost, and there is no need, no warrant for the first tier to re-examine the status of the assets on which it's found in our favour on this common law or judgment question. So that's what we would say in relation to, to ground two, unless there's anything else I can help the court with on, on that. And that takes me to my own friend's ground three, where he challenges the treatment of the walls and the slab in the vaporization facility. You may recall that the first tier decided that the walls and the slab provide support for the pipework which was necessary for the processing of pails. And that's paragraph 98, subparagraph 5 in the first tier. First tier then said, well, you don't get writing down allowances on the basis that the vaporization facility was part of the setting or premises, and supporting the pipework was a premises function. And that's also paragraph 98.5 in the first tier. And the upper tribunal point out that that's an error of law. Now, the reason for identifies the remaining findings of the first tier, which we're here concerned with the walls and the slab and the vaporization facility. And 102 records that conclusion. And then in 103, the FTT held the vaporization facility was not plant on the basis that it was part of the setting. It's not made explicit whether the FTT's decision in relation to the supporting wall and slab was reached on the basis that they were not plant, or on the basis that the expenditure was not on the provision of there, there's a distinction that we haven't yet specifically addressed. The statutory phrase in section 11 
is expenditure on the provision of plants. And it has been held in the case law that that extends to more than the costs of buying or constructing the plant itself, but it can extend to other costs which you incur necessarily in order to provide the plant. And the easy example given to the authorities is a delivery cost. That's Ben Odico and Barclay Curl. But it's that what explained why you could get the cost of digging the hole to pour the concrete and make the dry dock in Barclay Curl and digging the hole to pour the concrete to make a swimming pool in a case called Cook and Beach Station Caravans. That expenditure was held to be on the provision of plants. But there are in effect two routes in section 11 to a taxpayer seeking to qualify for allowances. You either say this pound I spent on the plant or this pound I spent on the provision of an item of plant. And the point the upper tribunal are making here very fairly is it's not clear in a number of respects whether the first tier were deciding whether an item was on plant or on the provision of plant. What they say reading on, however, the rejection of Mr. Peacock's argument that the expenditure qualified as it was to make plant usable strongly indicates that it was reached on the latter basis. What the upper tribunal is saying is the first tier decided against me on the basis that it wasn't on the provision of plant. They then say, the upper tribunal, on that basis, we consider the FTT's reasoning indicates that it misdirected itself as to the law because the fact that the walls and slab themselves performed a premises type function is not material to whether expenditure on those items was on the provision of plant. If the expenditure fell within the principles we describe above, then the fact that the expenditure happened to result in physical items which performed a premises function would not render it ineligible. It's an error of legal logic. We go on, of course, because the FTT did not consider that the vaporization facility was itself plant. It would follow that no expenditure on its provision would itself qualify unless it could be shown to be on the provision of some other item of plant. Nevertheless, we consider the FTT made an error of law within ground two in reaching its decision in relation to the walls and the slab. We say with respect that the reasoning of the upper tribunal in paragraph 103 is right. The first tier have not asked themselves the right question. And that is addressed at a little greater length in our skeleton arguments in tab three, paragraphs 84 through 87. But the important distinction is that drawn in paragraph 103 in the upper tribunal as to the function of the walls and the slab themselves not being determinative where the first tier had purported to answer their treatment by reference to whether they were on the provision of plant. Now what you haven't seen yet but is relevant to one of the issues in relation to list C are the authorities about the scope of on the provision of. Because can we quickly look at the fountainhead of this, if you like, which is Barclay Curl itself, which is volume one, tab 10. This is the dry dock. But in order to appreciate the significance of what their lordship has to say, I invite you to look at the beginning of Lord Reed 
hate speech, page 70 of the bond. himself that section 279 of the Act, in materially identical terms to our section 11, extends to capital expenditure on the provision of machinery or farm. It's the third line of the quote of 279. It poses the question, just above letter D, is the cost of making room for it expenditure on the provision of The reason he says yes is that this, a, the scope of section 279, can include more than the cost of the plant itself. The plant cannot be said to have been provided to the purpose of the trade until it is installed. Until then, it is of no use to the purpose of the trade. This plant, the dock, could not even be made until the necessary excavation has been done. So, I understand how, if one concludes that the walls and the slab vaporization facility of the plant, <coughs> you might say that uh, on this reasoning one could extend the claim beyond the actual construction um, to preliminary works uh, and so forth. But I don't see how this logic works if one concludes that the walls and the slab are not plant but premises. The point, my lord, is that the first tier had decided that the expenditure on the, the walls and the slab were not on the provision of plant, but it had arrived at that conclusion on the foundation that it had decided that the walls and the slab themselves were not plant, whereas the relevant question is, was that expenditure incurred on the provision of an item that is plant? No answer to that question. So, just. what is the item plant on that analysis? Well, it would be the uh, equipment that is held, supported um, in the facility by so the pipe. Yes. So, your your argument is that the expenditure on the walls and the slab is expenditure on the provision of the pipe. That's not a contention that the first tier address, because they have, with respect, answered the wrong question. Just to continue with 
um, Barclay Curl. Um, this is the point at which the, their lordship split 4 1. But for example, Lord Guest deals with um, necessary preliminaries, uh, page 80 of the bundle between letters F and G. Lord Upjohn, uh, who um, dissents on the main point, um, but not on the excavation. Someone can see that. Uh, between letters E, um, uh, E and F on page 84 of the book. And then Lord Donovan addresses um, necessary excavation and on the provision of <coughs> at letter H on page 85. So that's where there is first recognized this concept of expenditure being on the provision of plant. Just for your note, that also explains the disputed expenditure in Cook and Beach Station caravans, which is behind tab 13. The revenue in that case had accepted that the um, pipe work and equipment and plumbing and electrics um, necessary to build a swimming pool qualified, but rejected the contention that the terracing and the excavation and the concrete were qualified. And what Mr. Mr. Justice McGarry concludes is that those items did qualify because, like the excavation in Barclay Curl, they were on the provision of. That argument was attempted to be taken one step further in a case called Benodico, behind tab 16, got to the House of Lords, and there um, the taxpayer said, well, my cost of finance is on the provision of land. And the House of Lords said, no, cost of finance is on the provision of finance, it's not on the provision of land. Thankfully, all of these principles have been recently considered um, in a case called Inmarsat, which is in volume three, uh, tabs 47 and 48. 47 is the first tier. Um, 47 is the upper tribunal decision. 48 is the decision of this court earlier this year. That's a, a rather complex case. It raises a number of issues about the cost of putting satellites into orbit. But one of the issues was are the launch costs of moving the satellite from Earth <coughs> to a low Earth orbit, are the launch costs costs on the provision? in the upper tribunal decisions, that's tab 47, paragraph 64, you'll see that the, the issue was were the launch costs on the provision of plant, and then from paragraph 66 onwards, the upper tribunal identify the relevant authorities, starting at Barclay Curl, looking at Benodico, uh, and they then conclude at 74 that if IMSO had been the owner rather than merely a lessee, we do not consider there could be much doubt the launch costs to be incurred would have been expenditure on the provision. And that's a helpful summary of the principles which they then apply in a fact pattern that's very different to us. The case came to this court earlier this year, so that's in tab uh, 48, 
58. Uh, and it's Lord Justice Newey. He begins at paragraph 58, page 1044 of the Bible. And he again uh, recites from some of the relevant authorities of Barclay, Earl, and Ben Oliver. Just give me that reference again. Uh, paragraph 58, page 1044. <coughs> uh, and it's paragraph 58 through to 66, uh, and then on at 70. What his lordship does is he agrees with the upper tribunal that the costs of putting the satellite into orbit were on the provision of France. So I draw no analogy with the facts of that case, obviously very different. If you want the latest learning on the question on the provision of Just drawing those threads together on Malone Friends Ground 3, um, we think that the Upper Tribunal were right to identify the error they found in their paragraph 103, uh, and we support their conclusion. Um, Mr. Ripley helpfully reminds me in answer to my Lord's question, that um, the vaporization facility is not just supporting the pipe, it also supports the autoclaves. That's the first here, paragraph 45, subparagraph 1. Is there any structure supports that which is within it? The autoclave is just a piece of equipment has to sit on something. That which it sits on supports it. That can't be enough, surely, to make make the supporting the autoclave provision. Well, um, the first tier accepted, and that has not been appealed, that, for example, some plinths on which equipment sits. <coughs> yes, if you have a specially built plinth, and that might be the case. But all of this was specially built. All of it was designed to hold and support these very, very uh, special pieces of equipment. And it m may be helpful just to turn up what the first here do say in uh, paragraph 45.1. Autoclaves are a very uh, significant part of the tail's um, deconversion process. They are dealing with highly radioactive and indeed highly toxic materials. It was a requirement here that they were in effect cast in to this slab so that they could be seismically anchored so that in the event of a seismic event there would not be the release of either radiation or, or chemically toxic material. This is not just a case of a warehouse with something sitting on it. But for the nature
nature of the process is carried out at this site, we would not have built anything like this. <coughs> and that's all I would propose to say on, on ground three, which deals with Maloney Friends people. Um, that would take me, and I think I'm just about on time, uh, to our appeal, which relates to list C. Now, list C is relevant where we have passed the judge made rule for some or all of the assets. So we have to assume we've, we've done that for something. But you're against me on building, so I'm barred apparently by section 21. I'm then entitled to say, well, I'm I'm saved by the effect of, of list C. And you'll recall that section 21 is subject to section 23, and section 23 introduces list C. Now, as regards uh, list C1 and C4, uh, and here it may just help to turn them up so you do have them in mind. <coughs> in volume one of the authorities. in our submission as regards this particular uh, issue here to a number of questions. And the first relates to the 2001 legislation and a comparison of that legislation to the predecessor that was introduced in 1994. Now, I'll just give you the questions that, uh, and then I'll, I'll this is an anterior question, which is, what's the justification for looking at predecessor legislation? Well, that was going to be my question three. But Seems odd to put that as question three, because 
because your question one assumes that it's legitimate. Well, what I was going to say to your lordship, my lady, is this: um, if there's no difference between what was there before and what is there now, the issue doesn't arise. Now, there is a difference, but I need to show you what that difference is. And if you let me do that, the Benny essay, I'll then tackle the point of principle, which is: is that an exercise we're allowed to do? Unless you can see there's a difference. Oh, obviously, yeah, obviously, we understand that there is a difference, um, um, <coughs> and obviously, one of the questions we have to consider is is assuming that it's legitimate to consider why there's a difference, what the impact of that is. Well, um, yeah. But one still has to ask the question: Is it legitimate to go back beyond uh, the current statute? Well, I am going to tackle that. And I recognise it is a point of importance, a point of real principle. But, yes, you so why don't we course. start by looking at the differences? Well, can I show you the difference? I'll yeah, do it sure. as quickly as I can. Sure. Um, but that's going to be my third question. Um, and then I have a series of questions that just follow on from that, but I'll deal with those in the order. So is there a difference? Um, section 23, um, as it now says, Going back to section 23.3 provides that sections 21 and 22 also do not affect the question whether expenditure on, I can't invite you just to underline the word on, any item included in this C is expenditure on the provision of plant and machine. So if that's right, one could <coughs> usefully um, add to each of the items in C1 uh, to 16, um, sorry, C, uh, C1 to 21, the word on. Now, you'll see looking, running down an eye, that um, C1 to 21 don't begin with on the provision of, or the provision of. C22 is different because it's not looking there at expenditure on or on the provision of an item. It's an expenditure on a process, i.e. the alteration of land. So one can see that C21 wouldn't naturally fit with on the provision of. But be that as it may, from 23 onwards, um, the relevant words are the provision of. So on the face of it, reading section 23.3 with the items in this C, some of them deal with on the provision of plant, and some of them apparently do not. I won't get anything from the fact that in subsection 3, <coughs> as you pointed out, yes, we have the words expenditure on any item. But the question is whether that is an expenditure on the provision of plant or machinery. My Lord, no. I mean, provision of plant or machinery is the, well, the basic building block of the entire legislative scheme which we now have enshrined in statute reform. And that's a very long time. Yes. Yeah. There is a submission that I will make yeah. in, in a little while that the relevant statutory phrases in section 11 yeah. on the provision of, that is what subsection 3 of section 23 is designed clearly to mirror. Yeah. And where the draftsman refers in the first line, expenditure on, what he meant by that was on or on the provision of, because that fits with section 11. I mean, your basic point is that almost goes without saying in the context we're dealing with here. Is that right? well, that's where I'm going. Yes. And it doesn't actually need any reading in. It's just a question of how you interpret the words on any item in this particular context. Well, I, I would accept that way of putting it, or uh, another way of putting it is that if there is to be a reading in, it's a necessary reading in to give effect to section 11 and section 23 both as a whole. I mean, the, the problem you have is that on the face of it, on a literal reading, the items appear to be drafted in two alternative ways. One where, which includes the words the provision of in 23 to the end, and the ones before which said, and of course it's a normal principle of statutory interpretation where you have a difference of that nature, everyone assumes it to be deliberate. Yes. And I think you're saying that 
That's the, in, the, in this particular context, it's a distinction without a difference. Yes, and I'm going to say one can clearly or tolerably clearly see it wasn't a difference. Now, in order to make that good, I just need to show you where did this come from. Of course. Yeah. But, but the, uh, the argument my Lord was identifying is one that doesn't necessarily depend on the comparison of predecessor legislation at all. I mean, you, you, you can advance that argument on the terms of this legislation. I, my Lord, I, I could, and, and I'm about to in, in a little while, but the point that I face, um, the point that my own friend ran below, is, well, no, no, on is a deliberate choice there. It's deliberately designed to exclude on the provision of. But then it could be said, well, at least the, the one, one way of looking at this is to say, well, there's an ambiguity. It could, one, one has to look at the predecessor legislation to work out which way the ambiguity should be resolved. Well, when that, you do that, it's absolutely obvious. Yes. Well, that, that's, that's the other way I put my case, is to say, well, if you've got any doubt about whether on is deliberate, yes. one looks back and one can see it is just a transposition error. Well, not even an error necessarily. Is it? Um, well, it, 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 but it does give rise to a problem which would have been much, which should have been made absolutely clear, whereas we have a difficulty which we have to resolve. Well, look, yes. Just, I anticipate the courts are ahead of me on this, but just so you see where it came from, the original legislation, Finance Act 1994, is behind tab three, um, and that is, in retrospect, slightly um, organised in a slightly difficult way. But it introduced what became Schedule AA1, the 1990 Act, paragraph 1 1 excludes expenditure on the provision of. Page 15 of the bundle. <coughs> but then 1 3 says subparagraph 1 does not affect the question whether expenditure on the provision of any asset falling within column 2 of table 1. And column 2 of table 1. I'm sorry, one, I've lost where you are, it's my fault. I... Well, look, tab 3, page 15 of the bundle. Yeah. Paragraph 1 1 in the new <coughs> schedule. Yeah. Um, Bars expenditure on the provision of a building. Yes. And the saving provision is in one sub three, but it doesn't affect expenditure on the provision of an asset falling within column two of table one. So when you look at column two of table one, those items listed there are all preceded by the words on the provision of. But isn't it also interesting to look at the heading to column two? Assets so included, but expenditure on which is unaffected by the bill. Yes. And that must, in that context, mean on the provision of which. Well, Lord, it does. It yeah. must. But it, does, it just shows that on which can, in a suitable context, mean on the provision of which. I well, I, I, I contemplated both proceedings below making that point, but of course it is just the heading. Well, it's not just the heading, but it is part of the statute as enacted. It is. Yeah, and it's not. Hmm. <laughs> one can't ignore it. Well, it's uh, obviously only a pointer, but it's one which, at the moment, seems to me to support you. Well, we, we, we would accept and endorse it. Uh, and of course, um, uh, C1 is item 11 here, and C4 is item 3. Um, they're in a different order. One actually can identify each of them. Well, a couple have since been repealed, but they are items. Um, uh, that you find in this C. Now, the equivalent rule for structured assets and works, page 17, same tab, paragraph 2, there's a, a barring rule for expenditure on the provision of structures or other assets, 2-1-A. But then, Paragraph 2, sub 3, sub paragraph 1 does not affect the question whether um, A, any expenditure falling within column 2 of table 2, so if you just pause there and look at column 2 of table 2, from
from item two onwards, they all include the on the provisional language. And then if one goes back to paragraph two sub three little b, it also doesn't affect the question whether any expenditure on the provision of any asset within column two of table one. That also has the on the provision of language. Now there's a minor point to notice about that and a major point. The minor point is that in this iteration of the legislation, um, you could be saved from structured assets and works by column two of table two or column two of table one. But the reverse wasn't true. For buildings, there was one way out. For structures, there were two ways out. And that is different to our legislation that we're concerned with now, because list C is a way out to either 21 or 22. And that was a conscious change made in 2001. That's the minor point. The more significant point is that there is, again, repetition of the on the provision of language um, in uh, column two of table two and in paragraph two sub three b. <coughs> now, that uh, legislative code was rewritten in 2001 as part of the tax law rewrite. Here we need quickly volume four of the authorities. Behind tab 49, there are the introductory paragraphs to the explanatory notes to the 2001 Act. So sorry, which volume four, tab 49. Thank you. Uh, and I invite you quickly to note paragraphs three and four just to rewrite the Capital Allowances Act to make it clearer and easier to use. And then four, the Act also makes some minor changes there within the remit of the tax law rewrite project. And then paragraph five onwards just tells us about the tax law rewrite project. Uh, and then behind tab 50 are the relevant notes on these provisions. So it's page 1064 of the bundle, paragraph 169. And that records that what becomes list C is based on the, um, the old tables but it makes two minor changes. And then paragraph 174 and 175 identifies one of those minor changes, and that's the merging of the tables, as you'll see in 175 and 176. And it was recognized that merging the tables would increase the range of expenditure that would be unaffected broadening the saving effect. And that was identified as change two. And the other change related to caravans, you'll see that at 178 and that's change three. And then the annex to the notes, which is referred to is behind tab 51, and you will see there, I shan't read it all out, but there's a about a page explaining change two, and in particular in the middle of page 1067, there is express recognition that it broadens the ambit of the savings provision. Now, the upshot of that ground between us is that a change in the language between on and on the provision of in section 23.3 insofar as
insofar as it impacts some but not all of the items in this C, is not identified as a change. We reach a world in which the two legislative codes are apparently different. The difference is not identified as a change in a rewrite process that was not intended to change the law, save where that was recognized. Where in this uh, appeal, no policy reason has been identified for such a change. And if that change were respected and upheld, it would have a considerable effect on the operation of the land. As we know from Barclay Curl and Ben Odico, the delivery and installation costs, for example, on machinery are capable of qualifying for allowances because they are on the provision of the kit concern. If you have an item that passes the judge made test, but somehow falls foul of section 21 or section 22, and you might then seek to say, well, some part of that expenditure is on the provision of the machinery or the processing equipment that would satisfy C1 and C4, the effect of the upper tribunal's decision is to say, well, that would have been true between 1994 and 2001, but it's not true from 2001 onwards. And this is one of the points that makes this appeal of, of real importance to a wider audience. Because that reading of C1 and C4 means that there is a difference between ordering a piece of kit and paying for delivery, you pay 100 for the kit and 10 for the delivery, then this would be a barrier to allowances on the 10. <coughs> Whereas if you order the kit delivered and installed and pay 110 for it, arguably you're not. Well, might there then be an argument as to whether if it's a combined cost, this is a portion of the thing? Well, that, that may well be, but as a matter of principle, there is an apparent difference. Well, I'm not sure there is, but because it, if you have a combined cost, you're really paying a single sum for two different things. I mean, it doesn't, I can't, it seems odd it should make all the difference whether it's a, a rolled up price or separately itemized. I, I, I accept your Lordship's uh, proposition, of course, that, that in a sense is my point, but, but uh, an attempt to apportion so as to resolve the issue that C, this reading of C1 and C4 grows up is not, in my submission, a satisfactory argument. Can I just make this point? It, it's relevant. Um, if that reading of um, the legislation is right, um, it would also seem to reverse the effect of Cook and Beach Station of Paradise. We know that excavation of swimming pools was designed to be saved by List C, because that is C16, but the expenditure in Cook that was in dispute was the, the digging and the concrete costs <coughs> held by just McGarry to be on the provision of the swimming pool, which was the plant. And yet the upper tribunal's reading of C1 and C4 would mean that a case that Parliament intended to preserve the effect of in 1994 was reversed, or the effect was reversed in 2001. And we say that's not, um, not identified as an intention of Parliament. <coughs> no policy reason why that should be the case, nor has one ever been offered by the, the commissioners in, in this appeal. So one was left either with the possibility that one reads on in section 23.3 as clearly being designed to extend in context to on the provision of, or if not, one recognizes
recognise is that by a comparison between the old legislation and the new, one can see that there has been a drafting error, a transposition error, where absurd or difficult results will follow. There is no sign of a deliberate intention by Parliament to make that change. So one is entitled in those circumstances adopting the approach in Holland Estate or in Inco Europe to correct that error because there is no doubt as to the allegedly missing word. And that's why in short form we say the first tier and the upper tribunal below heard. First tier said it was a rather fine point that they thought the use of the word on was clear. They thought that was a careful choice by Parliament. Well, there's no sign of that careful choice. Um, the upper tribunal said, well, it's clear that there was no intention to change the law at the point of the tax law rewrite in 2001, but they thought that the revenues approach to this question was the better one because the wording is plain, so on. Parliament knew about the case law and on the provision of, um, and they thought that the literal construction was not uh, an absurd one, such that there was no clear and obvious error. And for the reasons we set out in our schedule, we, we don't believe that any of that holds, holds water with respect. There is no sign that Parliament intended to make that change. Indeed, one can see the opposite in the sense we know that Parliament did intend to broaden the saving effect of list C, and yet the upper tribunal assume that at the very same time it was also um, intending, without saying so, to narrow one of the effects of list C. There's just there's nothing to support that. Nothing. Now that then leaves one question of principle, which is if we are going to look back to the 1994 legislation as a part of that exercise, um, is that something that this court is permitted to do? Uh, and here we ought to turn up what's said in, in Derry, in volume 3, at 39. Paragraph 7 and 8 set the background for that. Um, paragraph 9, he refers 
back, um, what his lordship is saying there is, well, there shouldn't be a constant need to refer back. The general rule, you shouldn't do it. And in fact, that's the general rule, which I think nobody doubts, doesn't mean that there may not in a suitable case be exceptions. Well, not exactly. It's not a universal rule that thou shalt never look back. And something that might suggest this is an exceptional case is the fact that nobody, the revenue included, has been able to suggest any positive reason for making the change which would have these maybe quite significant consequences. And the revenue, presumably, must be in possession of whatever material was used to make the changes. And if this was not part of what was positively intended, it's not a very attractive argument now to say, well, you just have to look at what Parliament said and you do legitimate to do any kind of archaeology to establish this was not what was actually ever intended. And perhaps just to emphasize that, we ought to quickly turn up what Lady Arden had to say. It's on page 752 of the Bible. She begins with paragraph 84. She adds, she agrees with Lord Carnworth that that's an observation. She refers in 85 to the preamble of the English Tax Act as part of that rewrite project. But she makes the point, not intended to change the rule. She also makes the point that it's of some significance that it receives less parliamentary scrutiny than other primary legislation. But then in 87, it would often be laborious for courts to investigate what provisions had been consolidated in a particular provision of the consolidated statute. It would be wrong in general to include it. But again, she's not saying never. So we say this is one of those cases where it is a helpful part of the exercise to look back. And then you have my submissions as to what we see when we do look back. Now, what consequences would follow here? It would mean that the first year did err in law as regards the scope of list C1 and C4. It didn't address the question of whether items of expenditure that might otherwise fail section 21 might be saved by those provisions of list C. So the consequence would have to be a remittal on this hypothesis? My lord, yes. Theoretically, I could say to your lordship, my lady, that if we get that far in the logic, it's an exercise you ought to do, but realistically. Particularly now that we have the more recent drawing together of authorities in Marsat as to the scope of the provision of, if you get to this point in the logic, realistically, if there is to be a remitter, it ought to include this question. And even if- The avoidance of doubt, this would be remittal to the FTT, not the UT. My lord, I think it has to be. There is no advantage that we can see in going back to the other tribunal because, with respect, they are in no better or worse position than this court is. It really needs to go back to the judge. Yes, and we had a rather similar point in the case, I've forgotten the name of it, two years ago, where the remitter plainly had to be the FTT because that was really the tribunal of fact that had gone into the issues in very great detail. And it was really only on that footing that they were obviously the appropriate candidate to pick up the exercise again and see if the errors of law which had been identified made any difference. Yes, and that would be the exercise that we think Judge Cannon, assuming it's him, would have to do. Yes. So my friend's stance here is to say, well, you can't look back beyond the tax law rewrite project. I've dealt with that. He says, well, the difference in the wording doesn't mean it's a drafting error. I've dealt with that. He suggests somehow it is a deliberate choice by Parliament, and I've addressed that. There is then possibly between us a procedural type fight as to what items, what are the items to which these arguments might apply. And there was going to be a procedural fight in the upper tribunal about that. But because the upper tribunal decided that 
point of principle against us about the scope of C1 and C4, it didn't resolve the procedural dispute as to what assets might benefit from that argument. So my primary submission um, is that that's not the sort of exercise that this court needs to get involved in. If this issue is remitted back, because that's where we get to in the logic, then Judge Cannon will be in a position to determine what is appropriate in the circumstances um, for which assets these um, arguments may be said to apply. So unless my friend wants to make more of that in his submissions, um, I won't address that further. And that can be resolved later in light of the guidance given by this court. So that's what I say about uh, C1 and C4. Um, that then takes me to C22. And again, can I invite you to turn up um, volume one? Again, we're looking at section 23. List C, um, item 22, uh, and this is page 27. So item 22 is the alteration of land for the purpose only of installing plant or machine. We, we saw it a, a few moments ago, but just for your note, that's the equivalent wording in 1994, so there's no debate as regards C22 about on or on the provision of. It's not a necessary part of my case, but for my part that makes sense, because you're not talking there about an item or an asset, you're talking about a process, money spent on alteration. So in order to rely on C22, if we need to, again, I'm assuming that I've got assets that pass the judge-made test in section 11.4. Um, I'm assuming I've fallen foul of building as regards some or, or more of the assets. And I'm assuming that I'm not otherwise saved by C1 or C4, which is how we get logic into C22. <coughs> We lost on this point in the upper tribunal. The upper tribunal refused us permission. You would perhaps have seen that Lord Justice Lewison gave us permission and thought it raised a, an important point of principle. That point of principle will, will appear in a second. But the conditions for C22 are you have to incur capital expenditure uh, on the alteration of land. That alteration of land must be for the purpose of installing plant or machinery, and there must be no other purpose for altering the land, hence only. Now, this may be illustrated by, by what hopefully is a simple example. Um, a glass house can qualify for capital allowances as plant under the judge-made common law rule. But before a glass <coughs> house can be used, indeed installed, it requires a concrete base to stand on. So digging the land and pouring the concrete to create a, a plinth is an alteration of the land. And that might be seen as part of the provision of the plant, or it might be a separate alteration in its own right. And that excavation and concreting might then fall foul of section 21.1, because it's a building, because it's part of the glass house. Or it might fall foul of 22.1a, because it's part of a B7 structure that's not saved by the saving provisions of 7a to c. Or it might fall foul of 22.1b, being works involving the alteration But that expenditure is then saved by Parliament because C22 is designed to apply in those circumstances to C1 
say that where you alter land only for the purpose of installing plant machinery, your expenditure is uh, saved and can qualify for allowance. Going back to the swimming pool example you were relying upon as part of your argument on C1 and C4, why would that not be covered by C22? Well, the excavation of the land and putting the swimming pool in, why does that not fit within this? It, it, in that instance, it's almost inconceivable we've fallen foul of building. So it would either be because the, the um, swimming pool is a, is a non-qualifying structure, or its works involving the alteration of land. Um, the answer to your question is it, it could fall within C22, but it also could fall within C1 and C4. Yeah. Well, it, it's not that it, sorry, I understood your point to be you were looking at C16 and saying, well, you know, that it was a, a, an attempt to preserve the decision in, in, in the beach station case. Um, and I, I, I entirely get the point you make that you know, there's prior questions which might mean that this would never arise, but we have to hypothesize that it becomes we, we are getting down to the question of whether there's a saving by Miss C. <coughs> you, you, your submission was, well, um, surely they can't have intended, given that Evidently, item 16 was put in to save the decision in, in, in Beach Station. Um, but what I'm asking is, well, why isn't it saved, if necessary, it may not be necessary, but why isn't it saved by item 22? My answer, my Lord, is, is it could be saved by C22. Right. The more natural saving is C16, because you can match the list of C to decided cases in the main part. But the debate in C22 is, is a different one. It's not whether it's on or on the provision of plants. It's whether you've altered land for a particular purpose and only that purpose. So but Sure, but if you're excavating in order to put a swimming pool in, it's quite hard to see how it would be for any other purpose. Yeah, well, I, I accept that. And there's no principle that all these items are mutually exclusive. I mean, there can be overlap to do with it. Or a given fact may or may not fall within one or more of them. That, that there is no case that says they're exclusive, and nor there is, there, is there any real basis to say that. I mean, at the moment, I can't think of any reason why they should be narrowly interpreted in that way. Um, I, I would accept that, my lord. I, I, and I take my lord, lord Mr. Barnell's point that, yes, maybe if somehow you felt foul and couldn't rely on C16, then maybe you can rely on C22 if you've got the right purpose. Now, in SSE, there was a debate about the operation of C22. So, SSE, we haven't looked at the detail, but it concerns a hydroelectric scheme in Scotland that has some external hillside water gathering assets and then there is a um, hydroelectric generating plant buried inside a mountain uh, with a, a head race that comes down from a lock into a cavern into the <coughs> generating kit and then the water goes out down a tail race into Loch Ness and there were lots of different issues in dispute in, in that case and it is on, on two narrow points going to the Supreme Court but the question uh, that's relevant here in SSE was whether works on creating, I'll put this neutrally, an underground passage for the water, and the perhaps recall there's a debate about tunnels and aqueducts, that's why I put it neutrally. The question in that case was whether those land works could be both an alteration of land and for the purposes of installing plants. And the first tier in SSE said yes. But the upper tribunal in SSE said no, because the works that were in issue there were on the creation of plant in situ, i.e. The, the passageway through the rock to allow the water to get to the 
generally stuff. And the upper tribunal said the creation of plant in situ is not installation. Now we challenged that in this course, and her ladyship was minded to agree with the upper tribunal, but didn't decide the point. And that issue is going to be addressed in the Supreme Court in March of next year. So if the revenue persuade their lordships that we're barred as a tunnel or an aqueduct, we have an argument about C-25. So here, I perhaps need formally to say that we think the upper tribunal's approach in SSE on this issue is wrong, and her ladyship was, was wrong to be minded to agree with it. But that doesn't matter for this appeal, because here the issues are, are different. It's not a case about creation in situ being or not being installation. The first question here is whether there's an alteration of land. And that depends on what is meant by land. And, and the second question um, is whether, if there is an alteration of land, is it only for the purpose of installing plant and machinery? Now, the reason I say the installation creation in situ debate doesn't arise here is there is no doubt in this case that there were items of kit that were made off-site, brought on-site, and installed. Now, the, the, the reason that's significant is that the upper tribunal with respect misunderstood the point we were making below, and I'll show you that in a minute. But I need to start with the alteration of land. Now, again, there is um, a useful exercise in our submission to be done here in looking closely at um, what Section 23 provides, like what, what all of Section 21 to 23 provides. Um, in the current version, so behind tab 6 in the authorities, um, land appears relevantly three times. So in section 221b, you're barred if you incur expenditure on works involving the alteration of land. That's 221b. <coughs> land appears again in C22, the alteration of land. And then land appears again in section 24, the provision that bars you for expenditure on the acquisition of interest in land. Now those three instances of land have three different definitions. So section 22 sub B, page 25 of the bundle, says that in this section, land does not include buildings or other structures, otherwise has the meaning given in Schedule 1 to the interpretation. Just so you can see the Interpretation Act, that's behind tab 2, uh, and land is defined at page 8 of the bundle. So if land includes buildings and other structures, land covered with water, and any estate in easement, servitude, or right in or over land. That's the classic Interpretation Act definition of land, and that's adopted in 22.3b, but modified. There is no, and that's for the purposes of that section, section 22, there's no definition of land in section 23. So we say, well, land in C22 bears its Interpretation Act, meaning unmodified. And then if 
we look on at section 24, subsection 2, land is given a specific meaning for that section, which does not include buildings or other structures, or b, any asset which is so installed or otherwise fixed to any description of land as to become in law part of the land. Section 24 takes the Interpretation Act and makes a different amendment. So you have there three um, specific definitions land, two express and one by incorporation of the Interpretation Act. Parliament apparently deciding deliberately to limit the particular definition in section 22 and 24 to that section only. There's another oddity here, at this point the boot is slightly on the other foot. If you look back at the 1994 version, Can we look at De Bene essay again? And we can have the debate as to whether one ought to look back. But in the 1994 version behind tab 3, um, it's para 21b that refers to works involving the alteration of land. That becomes section 22. And then table two, column two, item one is what becomes C22. And it's para three one that bars you from expenditure on the acquisition of an interest in that. So each of those references to land is given the same meaning by paragraph 5, sub 3, page 19. The definition of land in Schedule 1 to the Interpretation Act in its application for the purpose of this schedule shall have effect with the omission of the words buildings and other structures. It is the case in 1994 there were three mentions of land and one definition. In 2001 there are three mentions of land and by inference three definitions. Now, I quite accept the boots now on the other foot. If I say, well, let's look at the 2001 version, Parliament has gone out of its way to provide for three separate definitions. Um, that is a deliberate choice. Um, for our part, it's a consequence of merging the tables together. And the other reorganisation work that was done. And so the draftsman has determined that he or she must make provision for a definition of that. And I've done it in that way. That does appear to be a change between 2001 and 1994, but I quite accept it's not identified as a change in the explanatory notes. For our part, we see no difficulty looking at 2001 legislation in reading that reference to the alteration of land in C22 as including um, alterations to buildings or other structures, provided you have the relevant sole purpose. Now, why does that matter here? Well, that's to close off or hold at bay an argument from the commissioners that where Urenco started with a, a greenfield site, where they started with the bare earth, 
The first time they poured concrete, that was on altering land, because you're altering the physical earth. But there afterwards, when you pour concrete um, that might sit on a slab, you're not altering the land, because you're altering <coughs> um, some kind of structure. Yeah. If that is uh, run against us, we say, well, that, that doesn't give full effect to what is the 2001 definition of land. Yeah. That legal question as to the meaning of land, the FTT did not decide recognize that it's a difficult issue and said, well, I don't need to decide that. What the FTT did instead was to say, well, even if Urenko's right about land, its purposes were not confined to the installation of the plant or machinery, because the FTT thought we were doing something else. And our case is that the purposes that the FTT um, identifies are the purposes of installation of the equipment. And that's captured in the first tier's paragraph 151, and it's paragraphs 15 to 17 of our C22 skeleton at the core of tab 6. But here we do need to turn up quickly what the FTT said. Tab 17, uh, paragraph by saying there is a pure question of law here, he prefers not to decide, um, we have to have a sole purpose, which that's clearly not the case here. Um, he recorded my submission about the, the purpose of the, the altering of the land here, um, and uh, he says that's not good enough, he does not accept that submission. They were constructed in part at least to protect operatives, the public and the environment, to provide premises which house the plant and machinery, not for the purpose of What we say in uh, our skeleton argument in my uh, case on this uh, part of the appeal, if one turns to tab six in the core bundle, in particular paragraph 16, we say that altering land so that when installed, the plant and machinery can be operated safely, thereby protecting operatives, the public and the environment, we say self-evidently is a normal installation objective, and item 22 cannot sensibly be restricted to alterations of land by taxpayers who take no account of the protection of operatives, the public and the environment once the uh, kit is made usable. Equally as regards housing the plant and machinery, providing a suitable location for the plant and machinery is also a normal installation objective, and it will always be present where land is altered so as to receive plant or machinery. If intentionally providing a suitable location for plant and machinery is not part of the installation purpose, I can never apply. So our criticism here and in the upper tribunal was that the first tier failed to distinguish between objectives which are part of the installation purpose and objectives which are extraneous to the installation purpose. Had the FTT got that right, it would have concluded that the various constituent parts of the PMF where we alter land were um, constructed only for, I mean, the alteration of the land was only for the purpose of installing the plant and machine. So that's what we say is the error of the first year. Now, the revenues response, looking at my learned friend's skeleton on this, it was paragraph 41 on we say mischaracterizes our case in three ways. Firstly, it said that Urenko's case is, is that any expenditure with some connection um, with installation would fall to be regarded as having an installation purpose. And we say that's 
that's not right. We are not contending that some vague connection to installation uh, gets us home. It's quite clear that there could be expenditure incurred that was a non-installation cost. We are not forgetting the use of the word only in C22, but we do say you've got to be able to distinguish between non-installation and installation purposes. Uh, secondly, it's said against us that well, we haven't identified any limit to their concept, to our concept of installation purpose. But we say respectfully we have our case here is the same as it was in the first year and the upper tribunal. Installation purposes encompass the aim of creating a location for the plant or machinery to be used safely. And then thirdly, my own friend suggests that, um, that we have somehow uh, adopted an approach that is uh, inherently inconsistent with the concept of installation and the meaning of the use. We're not here seeking to refight the argument in SSE. It's simply that we have a different view of the question. So that's what we say was wrong with the first two. But the upper tribunal do something different again. I invite you to turn up its core bundle tab 12. Uh, bundle page 180, beginning at paragraph 133. Round four was expenditure on buildings saved by item 22. And then they set out the FCT's decision. Um, and then they record in 137 that we repeated our arguments about the meaning of land and about what, and our criticisms of what the FCT has said about installation purposes. And then they begin their discussion uh, at 138. They say they're satisfied the FCT made no error, and therefore they thought it unnecessary to determine the issue relating to the meaning of land. We're in the slightly unfortunate position that two tribunals have considered this thorny question and not offered a view, and so you don't have the benefit of judgments below on this issue. They go on to say we consider it to be appropriate for that question to be dealt with in an appeal where it is. There was then a debate about whether our case on this question involved a question of law or a question of fact. Um, and the tribunal ultimately concludes that this is a matter of law. So that's um, paragraphs 139 through to 140, and in 141 they record my main submission that the purposes categorised by the FTT as non-installation purposes were in fact a necessary part of the installation, but on the proper construction of item 22 they were proposed to employ the plant machinery. And then the upper tribunal do this, they say well let's look at what was said in SSE by the upper tribunal about installing, um, and they then record the debate in that case but to note, an indented paragraph 127, the argument in SSE is not at the point we're here concerned with, which is a debate about whether creating something in situ is installation. And that is clear in 127 and 128 in the upper tribunal in SSE. And it is that which her ladyship gives um, some encouragement to in the Court of Appeal in SSC, recorded in paragraph 143 over the page. Her ladyship said, although I see the force of the upper tribunal's reasoning and do not dissent from it, it is undesirable given the elastic nature of the words used in the case to come to the conclusion with their scope effectively in the abstract. 
But that significantly was her ladyship not determining a different question. But the upper tribunal go on in 144. The upper tribunal's reasoning related to the meaning of its law is not binding on us, like the Court of Appeal and see its force and do not depend on it. But that rather misses the point. Then they go on at 145. The FTT regarded the purposes described in the final two sentences of 151 as not being for the purpose only of installing. We consider they were justified in doing so. The proposed construct of installing would give an extremely wide means to the term and put little weight to the word only. And they then address in 145 and 146 what the first tier had said. But the point that we had made in the upper tribunal in this case was not the same point as had been made in FSE. We expressly stated before the upper tribunal here that the upper tribunal should proceed on the basis that what the upper tribunal had said in FSE was right. The point we were making was different. So the criticism we make of the upper tribunal is that they reject our appeal in this case in reliance on reasoning that related to a different point in a different case. I need just to develop that a little further because I know the time. But we are now ahead slightly of the rough running time. Good. So we'll rise now and we'll take the matter under advisement.